Great. Well, let's go ahead and get started. Well, welcome everybody to the, the 2020 Massachusetts Opiate Screening and Awareness Day. And this is actually the first one, and hopefully it will be of many. Um, we, we came up with this idea probably over a year and a half ago at this point, and my co-director, uh, Dr. Douglas Jacobs, uh, reached out to me with the idea of having a screening for awareness about opioids. At the time, we were losing over 2,000 lives a year in the Commonwealth, and he wanted to have something where we could recognize and talk about this disease, talk about cutting edge treatment, and get people to treatment. Um, little did we know that there would then be a pandemic that would uh, throw a wrench in everything, uh, to the point where we were just about to cancel the day. Uh, and then we said, you know what, we still need to have this because especially with COVID, there are so many people that are suffering with this disease. It's even more important now. So I'm delighted that we're, we've gone forward I'm, I'm so thankful to all the people that have been involved in supporting this. There are hospitals, clinics, other facilities all across the Commonwealth. Uh, and just the, the support has, has just been amazing. So, so thank you all for participating. I do want to quickly point your attention to two resources. The first is our website. It's www.opioidscreening.org. Uh, again, Doug and his team with, uh, with Marcy, a couple other people uh, put this site together. And it, it is an extremely comprehensive uh, website. You can take a, a free screening there, which is completely anonymous. You can take it for yourself or for a loved one. And then it, it lists a whole host of resources and education. In fact, I'm not aware of any other site that has so many resources for the state of Massachusetts, which are available. We tried to get as many communities as possible uh, from all around the state. And if you're having trouble, you can't access care. We also want to point your attention to the Massachusetts Substance Use Helpline, which is one 800 327-5050. Again, it's 1-800-327-5050. Uh, you can also access the resources with this QR code. So if you like to use your cell phone for that, you can do that. And again, please, throughout the day, take a look at www.opioidscreening.org. We're really delighted to be uh, welcomed by uh, so many important figures in the state um, who have lent their time to, uh, to welcome us to this event. So for the next 15 to 20 minutes, we're going to have some welcoming remarks. Uh, we'll then give a little introduction to the day. And then we have a great panel of speakers lined up for you that goes from around 9.30 to 11 o'clock. Uh, if you can't join the whole thing, don't worry. We will be recording this and we'll, we'll be posting it online so you can access it. But to kick things off, I'd, I'd really like to, uh, to welcome uh, someone who's become a true champion for this, this issue. Uh, I can't advance my slides, but I'll figure that out. Um, and uh, a, a real friend of, um, of, of medicine, of his community. And this is Representative John Santiago. Uh, John represents the district around uh, the, the South End, uh, but not only that, he's also a practicing emergency physician working at, at Boston Medical Center. And he's actually currently active duty military. Uh, well, I don't know if you're active duty, but you're, you're military and you're, you're uh, serving currently uh, abroad. And just the fact that you, you called in today uh, to give some welcome remarks just, just isn't a, a true testament to your commitment to this issue. Um, I'm welcome, I want to hand the floor over to you and uh, thank you so much for joining us. Great. Um, well, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Weiner, for the invitation and to, to Dr. Jacobs for really making sure that we continue to highlight this important issue. Um, you know, I see so many colleagues in government and medicine on the call right now. Many of you have served as mentors, whether in the policy world or in the trenches. And so I think, you know, and if I hadn't met you, I'm sure I probably read some of your stuff online that have contributed to my, you know, own education when it comes to substance use disorder. As someone who is relatively new to this issue, who's coming through it from the, the lens of an emergency room doctor and as someone as, as a policymaker, um, you know, you're absolutely right, Scott. I think when you're, you, what you prefaced your remarks with, um, that the reason why you decided to keep this opioid screening and awareness day on, um, there's no doubt that, um, you know, the opioid issue, substance use disorders remain, what I would argue before COVID-19 was the public health crisis of my generation. Now, obviously that's changed a bit with, with COVID-19 and the systemic racism and Jordan the murder, George Floyd, but it's still an issue. I mean, you only have to walk in my district. You know, I live on the corner of Massachusetts Avenue in Tremont, and I work at Boston Medical Center to see what's going on right there with people have unfortunately dubbed as methadone mile, which I will refer to as mass and cast, that there's still a significant problem 
um, when it comes to this issue. And although we've made strides um, as a state government, and we've poured a, a number of resources and we've made some incredible investments and had some good things, but this still remains an important and seminal issue and it cannot be overshadowed um, by COVID-19 and, and by um, the systemic racism issues that we're dealing with. Um, but it's important that we take away a couple of things, I would say, you know, like many of you on the phone, I was in the trenches during COVID-19, I worked each and every week, but applying some of those lessons learned from those two, from the dual pandemic of, of COVID-19 and, um, and systemic racism to, to substance use disorder, something that I am, am, am taking more seriously and considering more in my approach. And I think first and foremost is our commitment to the social determinants of health. I think when we look at COVID-19, if you were black or brown, poor, had housing instability, you were hit more uh, devastatingly by this disease. And I think the same thing can be said when it comes to substance use disorder. I think about my patients, many of which who line mass and CAS. Um, and I think about what the city was able to do uh, thanks to the efforts of people like Marty Walsh and some of the homeless shelters, that if you gave someone housing, that they were less likely to be um, impacted by COVID-19. I think the same thing can be said when it comes to substance use disorder. And so I think that's why we in government need to continue to double down on our commitment to the to, to social determinants of health. The second thing I'll add is that I think this allows us to be innovative. Um, you know, I think, uh, you know, when it comes to, I wrote an op-ed when, uh, when COVID-19 first started and I, you know, wanted to use it as an opportunity to be innovative in medicine and in treatment and care. I think whether it comes to advancements in telehealth or just, you know, delivery approaches to things like MAT and methadone that we've seen, I think there are a number of things to take away from COVID-19. And so I look forward to participating in this dialogue, in this debate. I know I don't know how long I can be on, um, but I'm more than happy to call in from the Middle East and, and, to, and to listen in and partake in this discussion and look forward to continuing the conversation as we move forward in this important fight. Thank you. Great, thank you so much, Representative Santiago. So we then have some welcome remarks from Senator Julian Sear. Uh, Senator Sear represents the Cape and the Islands. Uh, he's unable to join us today in person, but he did record a message for us, and so we'd like to play that. Hello, I'm Julian Sear. Uh, I represent Cape Cod, Martha's Vineyard, and Nantucket in the Massachusetts Senate, uh, and I'm the Senate Chair of the Joint Committee on Mental Health, Substance Use, and Recovery. Uh, and it's so good to be with all of you, uh, albeit remotely, uh, for the Massachusetts Opioid Screening uh, and Awareness Day. Uh, I want to thank a number of folks who, who made today happen. Um, first and foremost, uh, Dr. Doug Jacobs uh, and Dr. Scott Weiner. Thank you so much for uh, making today happen, for your persistence, for your advocacy. Uh, I'm delighted to be joined today by my colleague, uh, Dr. John Santiago, who is a state representative uh, and a member of, uh, of the Joint Committee on Mental Health, Substance Use and Recovery, a tremendous advocate, uh, patient advocate and provider in his own right. Uh, and it's also great to be here with uh, Dr. David Rossman uh, from the Massachusetts Medical Society. Um, Y'all don't need uh, to have me tell you um, that addiction, uh, and particularly addiction to opioids, has been a real persistent epidemic that has touched so many lives uh, and families across Massachusetts for well over a decade. Uh, the Commonwealth has been striving to uh, meet the challenge of, of this epidemic. I, I think we've in some ways made some uh, admirable progress, but there's a lot of work to do. Uh, and now compound, compounded by uh, the COVID-19 pandemic, which has really revealed um, so many vulnerabilities uh, that, that we knew about and, and, and we've seen in our community and our society, and it's really revealed them to be you know, true gaping fissures. And I think that's very much true with addiction. Uh, COVID-19 has made it harder for uh, folks to access addiction services, to get help when they need it. Uh, we have more and more people who um, are uh, struggling to, to, to cope and really uh, needing a lot of help now more than ever. And so that's why it's so crucial that we're coming together um, for Massachusetts Opioid Awareness and Screening Day. Uh, to make sure that we're still talking about and, and, and being persistent in our work around um, stemming the open epidemic and ending the open ep epidemic while we're in this broader um, uh, global epidemic related to COVID-19. Uh, the Joint Committee on Mental Health, Substance Use and Recover, uh, Recovery, we have been busy. Um, I'm, I'm deeply fortunate to have a tremendous co-chair uh, in Representative Marjorie Decker, 
uh, and the committee has put out really strong legislation uh, on a number of areas. Um, it, us being Massachusetts, we're pushing the envelope. Uh, we released a, a bill from the committee earlier this year uh, that would pilot supervised consumption sites, trying to find um, every and any way uh, and policy and program we can advance to save lives. Uh, I also wanna bring greetings from Senate President Karen Spilka, who, uh, who's championing of mental health and substance use needs um, and, and those who are, are living with addiction uh, is very much on her mind. Uh, and the Senate, working in partnership with the House, uh, has really um, worked hard to make sure that Massachusetts is a leader uh, in responding to the open epidemic. Uh, that includes awareness, that includes screening, uh, and so much of the work that, that many of you are involved in. So um, uh, it's good to be with you, albeit remotely. I'm looking forward to the time when we can uh, gather together in person. Uh, but until then, you have my commitment to continue to be uh, tireless and fierce uh, in my advocacy and support of addiction services uh, and doing everything we can uh, to stem the scourge of uh, opiate addiction. Thank you so much for having me, uh, sending my best, and uh, enjoy the rest of the program. Take good care. And um, in addition to Senator Sear, we also have welcoming remarks from Dr. David Rossman, who is the president of the Massachusetts Medical Society. Good morning. I'm so pleased to be part of this virtual town hall on such an important topic. Thank you to Dr. Jacobs and Dr. Weiner for developing and organizing today's event. And thank you for representatives Dr. Santiago and Senator Sear for participating for all your hard work regarding the challenges surrounding opioids and advocating, doing the important work of advocating for individuals with substance abuse disorder. I'm Dr. David Rossman, president of the Massachusetts Medical Society. The Mass Medical Society is a statewide membership organization for physicians and medical students. Members of MMS have been concerned about the inappropriate use of prescription opioids for years, both by prescribers and by patients. You'll find that physicians will try an array of treatment options for patients' pain before they prescribe an opioid. As part of those options, the Medical Society also advocates for expanding insurance coverage for evidence-based non-opioid prescription and over-the-counter pain management options. Physicians, as they, we always do, we use our best clinical judgment when treating our patients. The Medical Society developed guidelines for physicians when prescribing opioids. These guidelines include specifics for patients with chronic pain, for elderly patients, and other special circumstances or demographics. And physicians will discuss the risks, benefits, and terms for continuing opioid medications with our patients. Patients and their families and caregivers can all help with the misuse or abuse of opioids. Here are the ways that we can do that. First, be sure to store these and all medications safely. In my home, we have a lockbox and that's where we keep them all. Safe storage can include a lockbox and not sharing with anyone. You know to keep these and other medications away from children. For parents watching this forum, Talk to your tweens and teens about the dangers of drugs. Learn CPR. It can save a life, not, and not only in the case of overdose. Carry naloxone. If you know someone who may one day overdose, there is a statewide standing order so that retail pharmacies in Massachusetts can dispense naloxone without a prescription. If you do inject illicit drugs, know where to get clean needles. Massachusetts has needle exchange programs across the state. And finally, Carry the information you learn and the resources available today with you and share with others. We must reduce the stigma of addiction. Know the signs and be brave enough to get help when needed. Thank you so much for participating today. So to give our, our final welcoming remarks before we kick off the program, I would like to welcome Mayor Marty Walsh from Boston. Um, I've heard Mayor Walsh speak about this topic before. He is extremely passionate about it. He has committed so many uh, resources and time to this issue. And we are absolutely delighted that he's joined us to help welcome us this morning, uh, Mayor Walsh. Thank you very much. And I wanna thank all, all, uh, all the speakers today, all the panelists today. Um, you know, this is a, a very challenging time. Uh, I wanna thank uh, particularly Dr. Jacobs for, for, you, for creating Massachusetts Opioid Screening Awareness Day. Um, these have been difficult times uh, since January of this year with the COVID-19 crisis. Uh, and it's really had to force a lot of people, a lot of organizations, a lot of programs to to, to go online, including this event that we're having today. 
Uh, I want to thank everyone who made this happen. I want to thank you for being here today. Um, you know, Boston's commitment to recovery supports um, happened long before COVID-19. Uh, we were battling another public health crisis, the opioid epidemic. Uh, the city of Boston has been a long leader in this fight. Uh, in, back in 2014, we created the first municipal office of recovery services. Uh, working with the community and local providers, we built one of the strongest recovery networks in the country. Uh, we made it easier for people to access quality, affordable care, uh, something that, that wasn't always the case. Uh, we're training first responders as recovery coaches, uh, and they're out there doing the work now. Uh, we diverted more people into treatment instead of the criminal justice system. And I want to give a shout out to some of the um, Judge Coffey and some other folks in, in the courts that, that helped us do that, understanding that uh, people that uh, have substance use disorder uh, have, have, a, have, a, have an illness, have a disease, and we need to treat them as such and, and work to get them into treatment rather than get them into incarceration. Uh, we're also working to make sure people have the tools they need to sustain their recovery uh, with major investments in affordable housing, job training, reentry programs. You have to cure the entire person. Uh, we're prioritizing prevention education, especially our young people. Uh, we'll focus on equity, and we're going to we're going to be working very closely to 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 work on these disparities in, in care. Um, the work that we continue to do out in the Mass and Cass area of Boston that unfortunately has been kind of the the the, the picture of 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 substance use disorder. Uh, we we created a Mass and Cass 2.0 strategic plan uh, focuses on public health, public safety, quality of life. Um, it addresses the impact of substance use disorder as well as trauma. Uh, that people experience poverty, mental health, and homelessness. Um, you know, the COVID-19 uh, pandemic has certainly underscored the urgency of this work. Uh, it's been especially hard for people with substance use disorder. Uh, we know how many people through our region rely on recovery programs on a daily basis, and that's something that we, we need to continue to deliver. Uh, that's why all the recovery services have remained open throughout the entire coronavirus emergency here in Boston. Uh, our serve, recovery services staff have done some really amazing work, and they're not getting the recognition, as neither do ever, but the, they are heroes, and I'm deeply thankful to their commitment in the city. I'm also thankful to all the folks today on this call that, that do this, this work. I want to thank you for, for what you do, um, because your commitment uh, to making sure that people get, get healthy and safe is something that's really important. Uh, we, we, you know, as, as the pandemic goes on, we're still committed to building a comprehensive recovery campus on Long Island and Boston Harbor. Uh, Long Island Recovery Campus will help close the gaps between the stages of recovery. Uh, the pandemic certainly has shown how important uh, a bold long-term investments in community health is needed. The Long Island, Long Island Campus will help um, a very important part of our commitment here in Boston, but throughout the Commonwealth. Uh, in the meantime, we'll continue, we're going to continue to make it easier for people to to safely access recovery services. And unfortunately, that's not getting the attention it deserves. And I heard Senator Sear talk about safe consumption sites, and, and that's something that's a part of the tool. But uh, you know, with all the work that, that's going on and with the place we're in today, uh, it's really important for us to understand the importance of keep continuing to do this work. Um, the pandemic, uh, you know, the pandemic is a perfect time for somebody with substance use disorder. Uh, it allows you to isolate, allows you to disconnect, allows you to stay to yourself. And as somebody in recovery, certainly I understand those feelings. But uh, I think it's important for us that we continue to stay positive, continue to move forward, continue to do all the great work you do, all we, you do not me, what we do together. Uh, I want to thank everyone who made this virtual event a reality. Uh, I want to thank today, uh, you'll hear from some incredible leaders that are doing this work. So I want to thank all of you for helping us raise awareness, fight the stigma, uh, and get the people they get the people the support they need. So again, thank you for the opportunity, and, and to to all the folks that that, that have spoken, all the folks that are speaking. Thank you very much for your work. Great. Thank you so much, Mayor Walsh. Um, I actually was able to joke to my family that you're going to be opening for me, and it was actually perfect because you teed up a lot of the same messages that I wanted to talk about. But thank you so much to your, for your commitment to this issue. Thanks, Doc. So just to conclude in this last session, I just want to give a little bit of updates of where we're at in 2020 with with the opiate epidemic. So um, when I think of the US overdose and death epidemic, it, I'm reminded of the story of the, the, you know, the frog in the hot water, where you know, if you put a frog in, in cold water and slowly heat it up, it will stay there until it dies. And if you put a frog in boiling hot water, it's going to jump out immediately to, to save its life. And I feel like this is very similar when we're comparing these two epidemics of the opiate crisis and the pandemic from COVID. As you think of all the lives lost from COVID in the past 
eight months, nine months, we've, we've lost around 200,000 lives in our country. But if you look at what's happened with, with death involving opioids, you know, back in 1999, 2000, uh, when I first started practicing here in Boston, uh, around the whole country, it was under 10,000 lives that were lost every year. And it really wasn't anything that we had we'd taken very seriously. And if you had told me back then that, you know, 20 years in the future, we would have lost 200,000 plus of our friends, neighbors, loved ones. I, I can't imagine that we wouldn't do, we wouldn't have done everything that we were doing for COVID with the opioid epidemic. And if you think of what we've done, we've, we've shut down society. We've uh, put all, all sorts of resources into helping people uh, cope and, and get by financially, um, looking for new treatments that we've thrown into to COVID, rightfully so that if you think of what we could have done if we had recognized this much earlier with, with the substance use disorder crisis as well. In fact, in the US for about three years in a row, we actually had decreases in the average life expectancy, uh, which is pretty staggering. It was the first time we had seen that happen sin in this country since World War I. Uh, and it was mainly attributed to the opioid epidemic. But we also know that this is just the tip of the iceberg, that you know, we, we, we talk about people who die because it's a, it's a very hard hitting statistic, but that's just the tip of the iceberg uh, when you think about all the people that are struggling with substance use disorders. And so this day is, is about remembering them too. Again, we've lost around 200,000 lives from COVID already in this country, uh, but as Mayor Walsh just alluded to, all the things that contribute to, to making addiction a difficult disease to treat, social isolationism, uh, food security, job insecurity, housing insecurity, uh, all of that just is compounded. And the initial data that we're seeing coming out of the state is that the, it's, it's affecting disproportionately people that are, su are suffering from, from substance use disorders. In Massachusetts, you know, we talked about flattening the curve with COVID. I think we're, we're doing our best to try and flatten the curve here too. Um, although for the past four years, we've lost around 2,000 lives. Uh, we're, we're battling uh, fentanyl and other synthetic opioids, which are just so potent. Uh, but we really have to think outside the box, which is something that we're doing recently, and, and really you shift gears with cutting edge treatment. Um, and part of that is, is just recognition. And even just talking about this, this is the point of the day, is, is awareness about this issue. Even just talking about this is important. It's time to break down the walls that stigma has, has, have, has constructed. Uh, this, for example, is a is an exhibit that has been at Newton Wellesley Hospital recently. It's they planted one flag for every life lost in our state last year. Uh, and events like this and installations like this just help bring recognition and awareness. But I, what I'd like to do is, is shift gears a little bit and actually talk about good news. Um, you know, we we plan to do this day in September, which, if you don't know, is National Recovery Month. It's when we celebrate people in recovery. It's when we celebrate that recovery is possible. It's when we talk about breaking down stigma, about treating this like any other medical disease. And I wanna just give you a little bit of a highlight in the last few minutes of my time of some of the great work that is happening around the country and around the state. First of all, we're working really hard to prevent new cases of opioid use disorder. We now have pretty tight guidelines within the hospital and clinic about how we treat acute pain, trying to avoid using opioids as the first medication. You've probably seen if you picked up a prescription recently that a lot of the pharmacies have a disposal box where you can bring back used or unused opioids or other controlled substances just so they're not in the medicine cabinet and won't be diverted. The state is, has designated resources towards a, a project called MixStap where uh, physicians can actually call and ask for help if they have a patient that has uh, pain and they need help with management or addiction and they need help with, with uh, guidance for that patient. Some work that my colleagues and I did showed that if someone had an overdose, was treated in the emergency room and survived and was discharged, their mortality was about 6% within a year. So about one in 20 people that had survived an overdose would be dead within a year. That's really lead, led us to change how we think about this. And now all hospitals in Massachusetts have to be able to provide medication for opioid use disorder. That's medicines like Suboxone which you're gonna hear more about during this, uh, this, this morning. And we're also obligated to provide a substance use disorder evaluation to patients who experience an overdose. Narcan, this used to be very highly regulated and reserved for only 
um, medical personnel, but we've realized that having it around the community is really helpful. Uh, I, I carry it with me um, just in case, you know, if I'm going to be on the T or the bus or even just walking down the street from my hospital. If I encounter someone that's having an overdose, just giving them a spray of this medication could buy them the precious minutes that they need to survive before uh, EMS arrives, before 911 arrives. And one thing I'm real proud about is this concept of bridge clinics. It used to be that people would come into the ER, that's where I work, they'd, they'd have an overdose, we'd put them in the hallway, let them sober, and then when they were awake enough, we'd give them a list of phone numbers that was called the detox list. We'd ask them to call, knowing full well that they would probably never be able to get into a facility. The wait times were too long and they were often full. Well, now what we've done is we've created these clinics around the city, around the state, which can allow, allow us to stabilize people for the first couple of weeks to couple of months and then bridge them to long-term recovery. And it looks like that model is, is really successful. There's recognition that addiction is a medical problem. You know, in Massachusetts, we're the, the top for ED visits for opioid-related issues and the third for inpatient discharges. So now a lot of our hospitals have addiction consult services. We can start buprenorphine or methadone in the hospital. We have more providers that can give these medications. In harm reduction, you've heard about safe con consumption sites, but not, not even that, but even just access to clean needles, uh, places like the Spot Center at, at Boston Healthcare for the Homeless uh, can observe patients that are at risk for overdose. Programs like these are, are so important to reduce the harm for people that are, are actively injecting drugs and they save lives. And also I wanna talk about stigma. Unlike most conditions, stigma in this disease is particularly harmful. And the words we use really, really do matter. So if you tell someone that they're clean, then the opposite of clean is dirty. And that really hits home to people. If you tell someone they're an addict, if they're a junkie, those words can break them. It's much more important to be person-centric and say it's a person with a substance use disorder. It's a person with diabetes. It's a person with high blood pressure. We don't define people by their disease. And the final thing I'll mention is you heard uh, Representative Santiago and also uh, Mayor Walsh talk about this, is that there is systemic racism in substance use disorder treatment. And just recognizing it is the first step, but we need to fix this. Recovery is possible. That's why we celebrate today. That's why we celebrate National Recovery Month. That's why we want to make sure people get the help that they need. Again, we recommend going to opiatescreening.org. There's a whole host of resources there. There's also the Massachusetts Substance Use Helpline, 1-800-327-5050. With that, I'm delighted to kick off our first session. We've divided this into three sessions with two speakers each. These are experts from around the state uh, that are going to share their knowledge with you, and we're so excited to have them. The first speaker is, is a dear colleague and friend, um, and we've chosen her to, to speak first, particularly around this issue that we just talked about, uh, which is inequities in substance use disorder treatment. Dr. Sarah Wakeman is the medical director of the Substance Use Disorders Initiative at Mass General Hospital, assistant professor of medicine at Harvard Medical School, and just a national expert on, on this topic, and we're delighted to have her uh, today. So, Dr. Wakeman, I'll, I'll pass the floor over to you. Um, good morning, everyone. Thank you so much, Scott, um, for having me, and thanks, everyone, for joining today. Um, as Scott mentioned, I'm an addiction medicine doctor at Mass General Hospital. I'm also a primary care doctor and um, still work in the general hospital, so provide um, addiction treatment in the hospital setting as well as primary care and addiction treatment in one of our community health centers. Um, I have the great privilege of co-chairing the MGB Substance Use Steering Committee with Scott, and I also direct our addiction medicine fellowship program, so training um, future physicians, or physicians to be future addiction medicine doctors. Um, I'm excited today to kick off um, by talking about inequities in substance use disorder treatment, um, which is an incredibly important topic. And although today's focus is on opioid misuse and opioid use disorder, um, which is an area that I've spent a lot of my career focusing on, I think it's also important to note that this is not just about opioids, that um, people use all types of substances and that uh, the drug overdose crisis has rapidly shifted into a polysubstance um, related crisis. 
as you heard from Scott, we continue to be in the midst of this um, slow tsunami of deaths related to drug overdose. Um, Scott showed you the numbers from opioid related overdoses. When you look at all drug overdoses, last year in 2019 was the highest year on record with about 72,000 people in this country who died from a drug overdose. That means that the peak number of deaths have now surpassed the peak number of deaths from HIV AIDS, from car accidents, and from gun violence. So when you hear people use words like pandemic and epidemic and crisis, the reason for that sort of language is really the scale of the crisis. Um, and I think Scott's uh, metaphor of the frog in the water is really apt because this has been sort of a slow growing tsunami um, that unfortunately continues to not get the recognition that it deserves. And a lot of that is due to stigma, discrimination, and bias that we'll talk about today. Despite this ongoing crisis that has impacted U.S. mortality, and despite the fact that we have decades of evidence showing us what are effective treatments for substance use disorder, and that we know that with good treatment, most people will achieve long-lasting remission, treatment remains uncommon. This was um, recent data released about a week ago. This is the annual, um, the National Drug uh, Survey on Drug Use and Health that's done every year. Um, and this looked at among people of a substance use disorder in this country, what percentage of them received any treatment in the past year. And you can see that the rate has stayed completely flat at about 10%. So that means nine out of 10 people with a substance use disorder in the United States don't receive treatment in a given year. And when you look at the venues in which those who do receive treatment receive it, um, very few are receiving it in medical settings where we would expect that people with other health conditions would be treated. And in fact, one of the common places that people receive so-called treatment is actually in the correctional system. Um, I think there was another health condition that was one of our leading public health crises where people were being um, supposedly receiving health care and systems that were designed to really confine and control and punish people, we would all recognize that as a huge issue. When it comes to opioid use disorder in particular, you heard Dr. Weiner talk about the effectiveness of medications. And um, that's one of the hopeful notes in this crisis is that we have life-saving treatment. So unlike coronavirus or HIV, where in other um, public health crises, we've really had to wait for science to catch up and for effective treatments and prevention interventions to be developed. With opioid use disorder, we have medication that reduces the likelihood of death by more than 50%. And um, this was a study showing the experience in France when they were in the midst of their own overdose crisis. You can see the peak number of deaths from heroin um, in the black uh, diamond there. They rapidly expanded access to medication treatment with um, the medication buprenorphine and methadone, and they saw an 80% reduction in mortality from overdose death. Um, so these medications have life-saving potential. And yet, in the midst of our own overdose crisis, we have not seen that sort of rapid scale up of what we know is life-saving treatment. And this is a, a paper that I wrote with one of my colleagues at the Brigham, um, Dr. Michael Barnett, where we looked at the growth in volume um, in buprenorphine treatment and methadone treatment, these two life-saving medications. And you can picture in your mind those curves I just showed you about the death toll. Despite that rapidly rising death toll, we have not seen growth in access to these medications. And in fact, 50% of U.S. counties don't even have a single prescription who can offer buprenorphine, leading to these vast treatment deserts across the country. So why is that? Well, a lot of it is because of bias, um, discrimination, stigma that becomes entrenched in our care and in our policies. I like to um, describe an example of what it would look like if we treated someone with another health condition the way we treat patients who use drugs and patients with addiction to really illustrate how this would arguably be malpractice if it were another health condition. So imagine a person comes into the hospital with a heart attack and they're told that it's their fault for their condition because maybe their diet or they have a high stress job or they haven't been able to take their medications, and they're given a list of cath labs or cardiologists to call, much like the detox list that Dr. Weiner talked about. Um, even if they're able to find treatment, they're told when they get there that they can't get life-saving medication until they talk to a nutritionist first and change their behaviors, and then they're sent home with a stern reminder not to have another heart attack. Now, that would be ludicrous if we treated someone with another health condition that way, and we recognize when people suffer, suffer from other medical conditions that um, often the, the results of poor outcomes are because of systems failures. We don't blame the patient. And yet too often still, despite the tremendous innovation that you heard about from Dr. Weiner, we continue to blame the patient. We continue to create systems that really set people up to fail. And when they don't do well, we tell them that it's their fault. 
So why does care for addiction look so different than for other health conditions like heart disease? Well, as I mentioned, policy is a huge component of that, and we're going to talk a lot about that. But ideology and belief is also another piece of that. And part of the challenge here is that physicians in the healthcare system has not been educated around treatment for people who use drugs or treatment for addiction the way they have with other health conditions. And because there's not been formal education in medical training or nursing training, um, we've been indoctrinated by the same societal attitudes and views that other people have, this notion that people with addiction have brought upon themselves the suffering that they deserve. And even though we're starting to talk with this gentler narrative around um, the overdose crisis, which um, largely is because it's affecting or perceived to be affecting white people now, but even as we start talking about this as a health condition, our policies continue to reflect this notion that people are doing something bad. We may say that they're sick and need help, but we design systems that make it really hard for them to get well. And so until we correct that mindset, Set and the way that that plays out in our policy, our approaches, our protocols, um, the mere existence of an effective life-saving medication like buprenorphine or methadone or harm reduction interventions has not been enough to radically shift care. These um, biases and discrimination are amplified um, tremendously as in all areas of healthcare when we think about the impact of racism. You saw this study posted just now by Dr. Weiner. This was um, done by a former uh, Mass General resident, Dr. Lagasetti, um, looking at access to buprenorphine by race ethnicity and showing the deep impact of living in a racist society and how that plays out on access to effective treatment for opioid use disorder, where black patients with opioid use disorder had a 77% decreased likelihood of being treated treated with buprenorphine compared to white patients. This should come as no surprise. Our drug policy in this country, our approach to people who use drugs has always been rooted in racism. Many people think of the war on drugs as beginning in the 1970s under President Nixon, but um, really it, it harkens back to 1914 to the passage of the Harrison Narcotics Act, which was largely driven by propaganda in newspapers and by politicians that was driven entirely by racism. Headlines like this horrific headline in the New York Times, the, the paper of record, as they say, um, really racialized uh, drug use and building a system of policy of control and punishment that has been rooted in racism from its start. Um, many people talk about the inadvertent outcomes of, um, of the system. I would argue that when it comes to drug policy, the system is doing exactly what it was designed to do. And, and the outcome is that people of color experience discrimination at every stage of the criminal legal system. They're more likely to be stopped, to be searched, to be convicted, and to be harshly sentenced for drug law violations. And when we look at who is in prison for drug-related offenses, the majority of people in both federal and state prison are Black or Latinx. This is particularly relevant as we have all um, suffered through the tremendous pain of bearing witness to what feels like an endless string of murders of Black people at the hands of police. Three of the most prominent recent murders have all had their roots um, linked to drug policy and to racism related to drug use in this country. If we think about George Floyd, who was murdered on camera um, as the police officer kneeled on his neck and killed him in front of um, the growing crowd. One of the other officers said to the crowd, this is why you don't do drugs, kids. If you think about Breonna Taylor, she was murdered in her own house because of a no-knock warrant, which is a relic of the war on drugs. Or Daniel Prude, who was suffering from a mental health and drug use related health crisis and emergency, his brother called for help. And the end result was that he was hooded and ultimately suffocated and killed by police. Racism um, is relevant not just in police brutality, but also in incarceration rates. Um, when we look at the differential across the country related to Black people who are in prison and Latinx people who are in prison, largely driven by the war on drugs, we see a tremendous differential between Black-white rates of incarceration and Latinx and white differentials. Um, in fact, in Massachusetts, the disparity between Latinx and white people in prison is the highest in the nation with a ratio of 4.3 people who are Latinx to, to every one white person who are imprisoned. And it's not just the criminal legal system where we see these racial biases and racism play out. Um, systems of supposed care or other systems that um, we see racism and drug policy uh, exact a tremendous toll. One example of this is the child welfare system where um, between 2000 and 2011, one in 17 white children were taken from their parents' custody. That number is one in nine amongst black families and one in seven amongst American Indian families. And the number one reason for involvement of the child welfare 
system or allegations of parental substance use. Um, as this quote from a, a recent report highlights, you know, this is not a coincidence nor an accident that the vast majority of parents involved in the foster system are people who are living in poverty or that Black, American, Indian, Latinx parents are overrepresented. Um, and that these allegations of parental drug use are really the smokescreen behind which these um, inequities play out. The other way that we see racism cause deep harm um, in uh, drug policy and issues related to drug use and addiction is um, around the myth that any drug use equals addiction. The vast majority of people who use drugs never have problems related to their drug use. I use drugs, I drink coffee, I use caffeine to get me through the day, I occasionally drink a glass of wine to relax. I think probably many people on this call are drug users, and yet I have the privilege of being a white woman in a position of power, and my drug use has never um, led to me suffering harmful effects at the hands of society. That is not true for other people, um, and this is a really important piece that I would encourage people to read by Dr. Carl Hart, who is a leading physician sci or a scientist and researcher um, at Columbia who has spent his career studying um, drug use. And he wrote this piece after the murder of George, George Floyd, emphasizing that exaggeration of the harmful effects of drugs um, actually leads to the death of black people, that it justifies draconian drug policies and, it just, and has been used to justify brutality against black people. So that's daunting to hear all of that, to hear how um, deeply uh, problematic and racist the system is in structure and design. Um, I think when we step back to what do we do about that? How do we have hope? Um, I love this quote that the beauty of anti-racism is that you don't have to pretend to be free of racism. None of us are free of racism. The system is clearly not free of racism, but we don't have to be free of racism to be anti-racist. Anti-racism is the commitment to fight racism wherever you find it, including in yourself. And it's the only way forward. So how do we think about this in the care for patients who use substances? When we think about inequities broadly in substance use disorder care, I think sometimes it um, helps me and it helps me when I'm talking to colleagues or trainees to um, encourage people to step back and ask themselves some questions to check their own biases um, as healthcare providers or as family members or community members or people who love someone who uses drugs. Um, to pause and think, would I respond this way to someone with another medical condition? If this person had diabetes or they had cancer or they had heart disease, would I be responding this way? Would I be, um, you know, administratively discharging them from my program for symptoms of their illness? Would I be incarcerating them, imprisoning them for symptoms of an illness? Would I be um, not trusting them or blaming them? Um, the whole way that we sort of approach people who use drugs is very different than the way we approach other health conditions. And then are there ways in which our approaches or policies may cause harm? Um, as you saw Dr. Hart mention, we tend to exaggerate the harmful effects of drugs. Um, and we tend to spend a lot of time in the health system thinking about the harms of drug use. And it's not that there aren't tremendous harms related to drug use. Of course there are, and you will hear about those today. But there are also very harmful ways that the, our policies related to drug use including in the healthcare system can harm people. And I think we often don't pause to think about the harms of our approach, um, the way we treat people and our policies. And then lastly, and perhaps most importantly, the thing that matters most is how we support the human being in front of us. It doesn't matter at all why I as a doctor think someone should change their relationship to drugs. Um, it doesn't matter why the healthcare system thinks that. The only thing that matters is, is that human being's life gonna get better in some way? Are they, do they have a goal that they're trying to meet around their health, their well-being, their life um, that we can support and acknowledge? And starting from that place, from really asking and listening and hearing people's most pressing needs and then being willing to meet those needs um, is probably the best way to begin. When we think about racism, in particular anti-Black racism, which is so crucial in thinking about addressing the overdose crisis and the opioid-related overdose crisis, and this was a recent report put out by SAMHSA um, that has uh, some a wonderful list of recommendations. Um, these top five uh, strategies for community-informed strategies to address the overdose in, in Black communities. Um, number one is implement a comprehensive holistic approach. So remembering that addiction is beyond the neuroreceptor level. The context of who people are, the lives that they live, the trauma they've experienced, if we're not addressing those factors, um, we can't just address the receptor issue. Um, to involve the community and um, develop multi-sectoral diverse community partnerships. Community-based organizations are the engines that are managing these crises before people get to the hospital. So if we're not forming those partnerships, learning, listening um, together, then we're really not doing the right interventions. 
Three, think about culturally relevant public awareness campaigns that campaigns, um, as this report highlights, have been whitewashed and make no sense to black communities. So are we thinking about our public health strategies and our campaigns from a culturally relevant lens? Four, employ culturally specific engagement strategies. Um, this quote is a, a wonderful reminder that the opposite of addiction is not abstinence, it's connection. The goal here is connection, human kindness, human connection. And then lastly, look at our workforce. Is our workforce culturally relevant and diverse? And at all levels, including physician and leadership levels. You know, I, I say that recognizing painfully that I'm a white woman who's lived with tremendous white privilege here in a leadership position speaking to you all, um, and that we need more Black, Latinx, Indigenous leaders. Um, and we need to not just think about peers and frontline staff workers, but at all le levels of leadership, um, uh, hiring, retaining, and promoting a diverse workforce. And then just to end, I think policy is um, probably the most important thing to sit with. Um, when we think about discrimination and inequities and substance use disorder care, people who use drugs are discriminated at every level, as we've talked about, when it comes to access to treatment, the way the healthcare system approaches them, um, the criminalization of drug use across our society. And um, as we understand intersectionality, people who use drugs who are Black or Latinx or Indigenous face the added discrimination and bias of racism. And so as someone who cares deeply about people who use drugs and addiction, um, we need to also be thinking critically and deeply about racism and its impact in the spaces that we um, that we are passionate about and the work that we do. Um, I often think about Dr. Kendi, Ibram Kendi's book, How to Be an Anti-Racist, and his focus on the importance of policy, that racism plays out through policies, and being an anti-racist requires recognizing the way that policies lead to racism. And I think when we think about inequities in substance use disorder care, they are also the result of both biased ideas, but also biased policies. We here at National Brigham and across Massachusetts have tremendous power and privilege. And with that comes responsibility to advocate for external policy change. But also we must look internally at our own policies and approaches and the way that they can actually be um, perpetuating some of this discrimination and bias and racism in the systems um, that we operate in. So with that, I want to thank you. Um, you have a wonderful morning. I'm excited to listen to the rest of my colleagues um, and really appreciate you all joining in your attention today. Great. Thank you so much, Dr. Wakeman. Um, there's already some questions. We unfortunately don't have time for Q&A because we have so many good speakers today. I think you saw Dr. Wakeman's email previously. You can reach out to us if there's questions that we can answer offline. Uh, but hopefully this will just be the start of a conversation that you can have, particularly around the very important topic that Dr. Wakeman just discussed within your own institutions and communities. And with that, we'll keep the momentum going, and I'm delighted to introduce Dr. Claudia Rodriguez. Dr. Rodriguez is the director of the Outpatient Addiction Program at Brigham Women's Hospital and at the Faulkner Hospital as well. Also a great colleague, uh, really passionate about this topic, and I'm delighted to invite her to speak. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for joining me. Um, I hope that the information that you've gotten so far has been helpful. Uh, both for your own information and also to, uh, as Scott just said, to spread it within your community. Uh, so I'm the Director of Outpatient Addiction Services at the Brigham Faulkner, also the Chair of the VCOR program there. And I get to work day in day and day out uh, with people who are working on the recovery. And so I'm excited to tell you guys about the things that we actually use. One of them is uh, buprenorphine. I think before we start talking about medications, um, I'd like to just take a moment to help us understand how we can humanize the person behind the addiction. And so one of the things that we need to think about, it's actually twofold. So uh, Dr. Wakeman actually mentioned uh, being able to appreciate not only the fact that there are neurochemical changes that happen, but also thinking about what trauma they've experienced, who that person is, what do they value, what do they find uh, that drives them. Um, and the way that we kind of see addiction is, is, a, is, is, is based on three cycles. And so I want you to take a moment to just think about what it would look like if you woke up in the morning feeling really sick, uh, physically ill, mentally unwell, anxious, um, stressed, frustrated, uh, really kind of desperate to get rid of that feeling. And that's what we call withdrawal or negative affect. That's that cycle of, of one of the cycles of addiction. And then imagine that you spend the next couple of minutes, hours, really being preoccupied uh, on how do I get rid of this sensation? How do I kind of do something so that I can, you know, wake up and go to work or wake up and uh, live my day? 
And that's a cycle of addiction that we call the preoccupation anticipation phase. And then the next phase is really once someone is able to actually obtain the substance. And that's what we call binge intoxication. And so if you can think about it, we are stuck in this cycle when we're struggling with addiction. Might start with withdrawal negative affect, goes to preoccupation anticipation, and then finally ends with binge intoxication, but continues to go uh, in that circle throughout the day. This is the reason why we see people are really kind of losing control over their substance. And one key point that I want to make is that addiction doesn't happen because people continue to enjoy their drug use. We know that substance use, as again, Dr. Wakeman pointed out, um, we all have you know, some sort of something that we do. So my coffee is right here, right? I had it this morning. And so the initial stage of a substance use starts with taking something in and actually enjoying it. But what keeps people motivated for ongoing substance use once the disease becomes of a chronic use is using in order to get rid of something negative. So time and time again, when I hear patients who are ready for treatment, they talk to me about, you know, not being able to actually do, not being able to actually function, feeling like they don't remember the last time they enjoyed using. Um, now, of course, some of that is still happening, but in general, what's actually motivating the behavior is this want to get rid of that negative feeling. Now, all of this is really, it's really based on uh, brain chemistry and things that change along those different uh, stages of addiction or the different stages within the cycle of addiction. So what does buprenorphine do? Buprenorphine is a medication that actually helps people who have been ex chronically exposed to substance use, particularly opioid use, to help stabilize some of these very significant imbalances that happen in the brain. I'm going to get a little bit scientific here, but if we think about what are opioids, right? So opioids are, neurochem are neurochemicals. We have endogenous opioids, which is what we call our endorphins. But the illicit opioids are those that we consider heroin, fentanyl. We have prescribed medications that are activating the same system, such as oxycodone, diluted, um, et cetera. And so that receptor gets bound by these opioids and generates the reaction of pain relief, the euphoria of feeling high, disconnected, maybe from trauma or from anything else. Um, buprenorphine comes in and binds to that same receptor. When I say buprenorphine, you may have more commonly heard of it as being called Suboxone. But the, the, the active chemical of that medication is buprenorphine. So it binds to that same receptor but instead of activating it all the way, it only activates it about 50%. So in somebody that has been exposed to these substances for a long period of time, and is now addicted to the substance, meaning they've lost control over when they decide to use or not to use, they have cravings to use the substance when it's not around, they have withdrawal from the substance when it's not around, um, they kind of use compulsively, right? These are, these, are, these are all kind of diagnostic uh, criteria associated with the opioid use disorder or opioid addiction. So in people that have developed that, this medication comes in and it kind of allows them to, to achieve some level of normalcy without causing the over sedation, kind of continuing to perpetuate that cycle. It's also long acting enough that if people forgot their dose one time or if they forget to take their dose the following day, it's not going to cause an immediate withdrawal process so that they can continue to live their life and not feel so stuck on the medication. Now, I will say that even though that's the case, you can't just stop it abruptly. So it's really important that people are in treatment while they're receiving this medication. Treatment also allows to, function, to work on other things that are associated with addiction. So social connectedness, um, being able to talk to a provider that's open, that, that, that can appreciate, like I said, the human behind the addiction is really important. Peer recovery models where individuals who are stuck in addiction don't feel like they're alone in the world and can really appreciate how other people are managing or dealing with those struggles. All of these things are really important. Um, so I hope that that helps you understand a little bit of what addiction cycles look like how somebody who is trying to be in recovery is really struggling with breaking that cycle. 
then why are a medication such as buprenorphine can be helpful? It's gonna help stabilize the person's brain so that they can then begin to be involved in other aspects of their recovery. That goes far beyond not using substances, but that includes just being the best version of them that they could be. And so with that, I'd like to introduce somebody that I have had the, the great gratitude uh, to be a part of his journey. Um, he is somebody that has been able to break this cycle and I'm going to allow him to tell his story. Um, it is really, you know, I always say that I'm inspired by my patients who are able to accomplish recovery. I get to see how difficult it is. And I also get to see how amazing and remarkable it is to actually see the person behind the addiction. So with that, I will turn it over uh, to Mike. Thank you for your time and listening. All right. So yeah, I wish I had made some PowerPoint presentations because that would help quite a bit. But um, I don't know how to do that anyway. But uh, yeah, so, um, uh, you know, I was in addiction for well over a decade. I started back in probably 06, 07, I want to say. Um, those, were, those were the OC80 days. Um, and uh, so, you know, it wasn't really like a, I think I was kind of maybe a, a, a unique case because there's not, there's not many social factors for what, why I was doing. I have a good family, I have good friends. I had, um, not, not necessarily depressed or anything going into this. Um, so, <clears throat> um, I, you know, I had to try to figure out what, what's going on with this addiction thing. Right. So, uh, the best way I can describe this, right. Is, is, um, I had heard this guy talking about uh, lobsters, right? And I, I like lobsters. I used to dive for them back before the sharks invaded the Cape. And um, he was saying like, lobsters do battle, right? And I think what he was getting at is like, this is an analog for the human uh, limbic system, basically. Like lobsters are, are more flamboyant than reptiles, but this is a reptile brain, he's trying to say. And and he says, uh, you know, within they, they do battle, one of them wins, one of them loses. Within one day, uh, the, the lobster winner brain has changed to a, to that of a lobster winner and the loser's brain has changed to that of a lobster loser. And, and the lobster winner is, is strutting about the ocean peacocking with his, with his claws up. And the other lobster is, you know, just moping about low energy, let's say. Right. And, um, so, uh, this is, this is kind of what you're doing in, in addiction is, if this is the, an analog, that it, you're trying to manipulate your lobster state, let's say, right? So, so um, uh, w when you go to rehab, people would say, um, you have anxiety, do you have depression? And, and you would say, and I would say, I, I, I don't know. You know, it's like, I've been doing this for five years and I don't have a baseline, right? I don't, I don't know. If I, so, so um, what, so just, keep the, the lobster state in mind, right? So then, then um, uh, Stephen Pressfield, he, he calls this thing resistance, right? And when I talk about a, being a lobster loser, you would think that like that's depression, right? But it's not depression. It's different than depression. Depression is like, I don't want to do it. And, and this is like, I want to do it. It's just harder, right? It's like, so he defines this term resistance, right? So resistance is like, you know, if you're a writer, what, why is it hard to sit down and write or something? Right. Or like, so the, the, in the way I would, would try and describe this is like, let's say you get in a, you go to football practice, right? Like you said, football practice. And then you, you get in an ice tub and, and your body is saying, get out of the ice tub. And, and your mind is like, well, there's good reason to be in this ice tub, right? So, so the slow system is like, get out. And the fast system is like, okay, there's reasons, right? But there's a lot of resistance between, there's a lot of mental, uh, whatever. There's a lot of resistance to staying in the ice tub, right? Because the, the slow system's like, get out of the ice tub. Whereas on a, on, a, on, a, on a moderately cold day, like today, you might go outside and still you might say, hey, you should go back inside, but it's not the same amount of uh, fast thinking to stay outside on a day like today, right? So it, the resistance, it's like the, the difference between thinking slow and thinking fast and the amount of difference, right? So uh, think about this, right? You're going along, I'm gonna get this on here, and, and this is 
your lobster state, right? Lobster regular. And this is just the basic life. And this is just what you have to do in life, the basic entropy of life. This is just like this top hand is just like, is just like doing the dishes and paying the bills and going to work, right? So that's going to stay the same, right? But if it, if you're, manip you're manipulating your lobster state, what, what Dr. Rodriguez is talking about is, you know, there's a steroids and testosterone kind of thing, I think, where you stop producing it naturally and, and the tolerance to the drugs and your lobster state start going down from lobster even to lobster loser, right? So you wake up every day and, and uh, it, you're just in this lobster loser state. You, you're not going to you, be walking around. And the amount of resistance to just take care of the normal entropy, life entropy, it stays the same. You know, if you want to be successful, that might be like, that might be going up, but it basically just stays the same. And as your lobster state is going down every day, the amount of resistance between where you start and where you have to get to is growing, right? So, so um, you know, you could follow that out. But when I say you're trying to manipulate your lobster state, what I mean is like, when we're at work, you can tell if someone's on drugs, right? Not because they're over in the corner uh, drooling. It, it, because like they, they, they want to move everything. Oh, I want to move this bucket. I want to move that bucket. I want It's like they, they're just in lobster winner. They're in lobster grand champion, right? And it's like, bro, calm down. You're going to hurt yourself, right? And then two, three days later, they, they can barely move one bucket, right? Because they're down in lobster loser. So like I think you see the movies, you see people shooting up and then they're, they're drooling in the corner or... Um, it's all about the three seconds of going from lobster loser to lobster winner. When really what, what you're trying to do is just stay in lobster winner, right? Um, th that would be like the ideal amount of, of, of a functioning addict is, is what, what, what he's trying to do, you know? And like I was saying, eventually, you know, you, you go down, 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 and life stays the same, right? So um, you, you got to start giving up stuff in life or, or whatever, right? So it's like people think you're lazy, if you're in addiction, if you're not, it's like, I, I couldn't even brush my teeth at the end, right? It's like, I couldn't even brush my teeth. And, and it, it's not that, it's that the resistance has built up so much that, um, you know, I, I could, it, it's just a matter of, it's, it's not, it's just you start at a different point and, and getting to that same end point of just normal life is it, considerably harder for you. Um, uh, so, um, like, um, I, you know, it's, I, we all use coffee, like, like you're saying, right? Um, everyone uses coffee, but it, it, it seems to be like that uh, w when you're an addict, right? That the, they're considered an addict, I don't know. And, um, the addiction like trickles down that, that hierarchy of whatever and, and, and trickles down to, to something that, to a base pillar, right? Like if you, if you, if you're, if you're drinking coffee and, and uh, you know, whatever, but if you're going to lose your house over coffee because it's below your mortgage on your hierarchy of whatever, then that's a problem, right? Whether it's coffee or not. So what, what, what seemed to get me out of that, that bind, right. Was I needed to uh, like, like the, what, well, you take the suboxone obviously is to get to lobster even so you can just, get the, the same amount of stuff done as everyone else. So boxing is not going to get you to lobster winner. It's just going to put you lobster, your, your limbic system or whatever your reptilian rate, lobster even so that you can actually, you know, function in life. Right. So it, it's so important to get to that point. Right. Because if, if you think about what I'm saying, th that your drug addiction is just a massive part of that hierarchy. It's like the whole hierarchy, right. It was like, by the end of it, it was like breathing dope, and then there might've been a little capstone at the top that was like everything else, right? So, um, you know, you, you gotta, you think you're just gonna tear that out and, and uh, not replace it. It, it. It's a recipe for disaster, right? That's a massive part of your time and um, everything, right? So, so uh, and, you know, and it, for Alcoholics Anonymous, this is AA for most people or God, right? Um, they, they hammer that in. They, they say, this is going into that hierarchy, right? And they just, just hammer it in and that's fine, right? But it doesn't have to be God. You know, for me, I, I, I know that big book inside and out and I just couldn't get it. Um, but 
just stealing another term for Stephen Perfect, he, he calls it a muse, right? And he's like, what inspires that writer to, to write? You know, it's like, there's something that, that holds him back and there's something that inspires him. So he, he calls that a muse, right? And, and I just call it that because it sounds better than something. Like you, you just need something. And it has to go into that hierarchy, right? It, 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 and um, uh, like, like it, you know, when I was in rehab, I was like, I'm gonna, this is gonna be the guitar. The guitar is pretty, pretty useful in rehab. But, but when I got out, I was like, this, this isn't as important as it was, as it was in rehab. So I was like, so, you know, I started gardening and trying to learn this jujitsu stuff. And I got like to read science fiction books. Right. So, uh, th that, that's my, those are my muses, you know, and I try and try and make sure that they fill that gap of that hierarchy. Right. So, so, um, uh, uh, you know, it, and I get it, you, you know, if you, if your resistance starts to build for something in, in your life or, um, you know, you, you, you start to slip down off. So you, you might want to check that muse quotient up a little bit or, or get to AA a little bit if you have to, but, um, uh, you just have to on top of getting yourself to lobster even so you, you can even fight the fight. You have to have some kind of muse to fit into that hierarchy so that, um, you can trickle the addiction out of that hierarchy. Um, am I past my time? I can't, I'm sorry, I can't hear you, but, but that, that's, that's about it, I guess. Oh, sorry. Yes. I think, I think, I think that was, that was excellent. And all I right, think we are right. at time. So thank you. Thank you for sharing that. Um, I'm glad you're, you're at lobster. What was it? Lobster, lobster winner. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> All right. Thank you, everyone, for your time, and thanks, Mike, for being here. Great. Thanks so much, Mike. That's it's so so helpful for us to hear your your story, and thank you so much for sharing with us. It's it's extremely important. Um, and thanks, Dr. Rodriguez, as well, of course. Uh, I think I'm going to turn over to Dr. Jacobs to introduce the next section. Well, uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Weiner, and uh, uh, our uh, previous speakers, and particularly to you, Mike, for sharing your story with us uh, about uh, uh, the reality of what uh, addiction can do and what's uh, needed to happen to, uh, uh, to recover from it and that it's an ongoing uh, process. Uh, our next speaker is uh, my colleague of many years, uh, Dr. Roger Weiss, who's professor of psychiatry at Harvard Medical School and Chief of Alcohol, Drugs, and Addiction uh, Services at McLean Hospital in Belmont. Uh, Dr. Weiss has pioneered uh, the whole uh, approach to the treatment of patients with substance use disorder and co-occurring psychiatric illness. And he's going to share with us his lifelong uh, career uh, about this subject uh, which is uh, critically uh, important, uh, and uh, we're uh, privileged to have him uh, share his knowledge and wisdom and clinical experience with us. Uh, Dr. Weiss? Thanks so much, Dr. Jacobs, um, Dr. Weiner, for putting this together. Um, I'm going to, let, I got to share my screen here. So, uh, I'm an uh, addiction psychiatrist at McLean Hospital in Belmont. Um, where we have a, a large uh, treatment program for patients with substance use disorders. And I'm going to be focusing on patients with opioid use disorder and psychiatric comorbidity, meaning other psychiatric problems. So the National Epidemiologic Survey on Alcohol and Related Conditions, also called the NISARC study, showed that people with bipolar disorder, which is one of the, um, uh, it's often called manic depressive illness, that they're 5.7 times more likely to have alcohol use disorder and 14 times more likely to have a drug use disorder than people who don't have bipolar disorder. If you look at major depressive disorder, which is a much more common disorder um, 
uh, serious depression, they're more likely, about four times more likely to have an alcohol use disorder and nine times more likely to have a drug use disorder than people without major depressive disorder. So one thing that we know is that psychiatric illness and substance use disorders often go together. Um, to focus on opioid use disorder, uh, which is really the key topic today, people with opioid use disorder at, are at much higher risk for to have a mood disorder. So if you've got an opioid use disorder over your lifetime, you're 54 percent, um, uh, you have a likelihood of 54 percent to have any mood disorder, 46 percent depression, 17 percent mania. People with opioid use disorder are five times more likely to have a mood disorder, 4.4 times more likely to have major depression, nearly seven times more likely to have mania, with almost 10 times more likely in women and about six times more likely in men. So if you have a mood disorder, you're more likely to have a substance use disorder. If you have a substance use disorder, you're more likely to have a mood disorder. Adults with major depressive disorder are three times more likely to misuse prescription opioids. So if you have psychiatric illness, such as major depressive disorder and you're prescribed opioids, you are at much higher risk to get into trouble with those medications than people who don't have psychiatric illness. Depressive symptoms actually are the most important factor that often drive people who have opioid use disorder to seek treatment. One study that was done at, at Yale Medical School some years ago compared people with opioid use disorder that were in treatment with people who were still using heroin in the community. And they found that they had been using similar amounts of drugs, had had similar numbers of negative consequences such as family problems, legal problems, medical problems, but people who were in treatment were much more likely to have a lot of depressive symptoms than people who were still in the community using heroin. So to give an illustration about the importance of depression, I wanna talk about a study that we did on our inpatient treatment initiation and detoxification unit at McLean Hospital. And it was a study of people who had had opioid overdoses. Commonly, we, the, if you read about opioid overdoses in the, in the media, and there were 47,000 opioid overdose deaths in the past year. Often the story is that th this is just an accident, that the drugs are really powerful. Um, people are likely to get fentanyl or some sort of fentanyl-like substance, that they, it was more potent than they thought and that it was accidental. But we wondered whether that was in fact true. We know that suicide risk is elevated in opioid use disorder. It's higher in opioid use disorder than other substance use disorders, and that 30 to 45 percent of people with opioid use disorder report having made a suicide attempt. Among veterans with opioid use disorder, the suicide rate is six times the general population. And in females with opioid use disorder, it's eight times that of women without opioid use disorder, for men, twice the rate. So, I go back to something that, a question that I asked someone when I first got into this field. This was back in about 40 years ago. And the question I asked was, what goes through your mind after you've injected heroin in a couple of seconds before you feel the effect? And this man said, I'm either gonna get really high or I'm going to die. I hope I get high. I never forgot that statement. So, I came up with a term that I like to use that people with opioid use disorder often have what I would call 
a combination of pathological optimism, meaning I think I'll land on my feet if I fall out of a tree, plus fatalistic pessimism that sort of that also says, and if I land on my head, that's okay too. And that there's a continuum from accidental to intentional overdose. It's not just yes, no, it was an accident or I was trying to commit suicide, but there's a continuum from I don't want to die and I don't think I will, but I know it's possible. So that's sort of what that patient said to me years ago. A little bit closer to the suicide range would be today wouldn't be the worst day to die. Then you can move toward it might, I might be better off dead than I don't care if I live or die. And then finally, I want to die today. So we did a study, and the study was led by Dr. Hillary Connery, who's the clinical director of our treatment program, where we collected information from 120 patients with opioid use disorder um, on our inpatient unit. 54 of them had had an overdose. And by an overdose, I mean, uh, we defined it, meaning that they either had to go to an emergency department or they had received naloxone or Narcan um, or both. So nearly half of the people who entered our treatment program had overdosed. When we looked at, when we compared people who had ever overdosed versus those who had never done it, they were pretty similar in most of their um, demographic characteristics, age, sex, employment, etc. cetera, um, with the one difference being, being that the people who had never overdosed were more likely to be employed full time. When we asked what was their primary opioid problem, was it primarily prescription, was it just prescription opioids or was it heroin slash fentanyl or was it both? We found that the people who had overdosed were more likely to be using heroin and or fentanyl and the people who had never overdosed were more likely to be using exclusively prescription opioids. When we looked at the treatment history of those who had overdosed versus those who had not, people who had overdosed had had many more detoxes and treatment problems. They had entered, they had had substance use problems since a younger age and entered treatment at a younger age for substance use disorder. People who had overdosed were more likely to have a co-occurring psychiatric disorder. 72% of those who had overdosed had a psychiatric disorder, but even those who had not overdosed, 50% of them had a psychiatric disorder. The people who had overdosed had more craving, more anxiety, and had used, also used benzodiazepines, drugs like Valium, Xanax, Ativan, They'd use that at a younger age. Then we, what we were particularly interested in was the question of suicidal intent. So of those who had overdosed, we asked them, just before your most recent overdose, opioid overdose, how likely did you think that you would overdose? In other words, was this an accident or not? on a scale of zero to 10, zero meaning, nope, there was no chance I would overdose, 10, extremely likely. And then just before your most recent opioid overdose, how strongly did you want to die? Again, zero to 10, from not at all to very much so. As to the question of whether it was an accident, only 30% answered zero out of 10, that they thought there was no chance they would overdose. The average score was about three, and 28%, more than one in four, answered at least five out of 10 that they thought that they would overdose. A I think our most interesting and powerful finding was the suicide question. Just before your most recent opioid overdose, how strongly did you want to die? Zero, not at all, 10, very much so. 42% answered zero out of 10, less than half. In other words, 58% of those who had overdosed answered at least one out of 10 that they wanted to die. The average score was about four. 36%, more than one out of three answered 
at least seven out of 10, and 21%, one in five, answered 10 out of 10, very much so they wanted to die. So in summary, patients with opioid use disorder are at high risk of suicide, and many op opioid overdoses have at least some suicidal component associated with it, if not a frank attempt. Evaluation of individuals after experiencing an overdose should address suicidal intent, and attention paid to psychiatric comorbidity may improve outcome in opioid use disorder patients and is therefore critical. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Weiss, for uh, informing us about this really critical subject and uh, uh, the, the importance of acknowledging the relationship between uh, psychiatric illness and substance use disorder and what we can do to recognize uh, particularly a suicidal intent and uh, address some of the topics earlier about the need for uh, uh, recognition that not only is there one but two illnesses uh, that need to be uh, addressed and that how they impact each other. Our next speaker uh, is Dr. Jan Kaufman who I've known uh, since uh, my days at Cambridge Hospital. She's Vice President of Addiction Treatment Services for the North Charles Foundation and Director of Addiction Consultation for the Department of Psychiatry at Cambridge Health Alliance. She has uh, been a steadfast uh, advocate and uh, providing her clinical ex uh, experience and uh, uh, care for patients suffering from uh, uh, substance use disorder, particularly opioid disorder, and her uh, steadfast uh, direction in, in the use of uh, a methadone for the treatment of, of this population. She will share to us today both the, uh, the clinical treatment and challenges uh, of uh, patients uh, uh, in her uh, methadone uh, clinic. Um, thank you so much uh, for the opportunity to be part of this panel. Um, I've, uh, I really think it's an important initiative and I'm just so delighted that it came together and I'm happy to share with being part of, of my colleagues as well. Um, I'm going to spend some time today talking about one of the longest standing most robustly researched treatment for opiate use disorder, and sadly, and uh, the most misunderstood. So I'm going to be talking about, you know, methadone treatment. So the topics I'd like to cover today are a bit about the history and efficacy of methadone treatment. So a little bit about the early research, who's appropriate for treatment, how methadone works, the services that are offered in an OTP, which is an opioid treatment program, and some of the stigma that prevents patients from engaging in treatment. And many of my colleagues have talked about stigma, and I'm gonna share about it, a little bit about it as it relates to methadone treatment. So um, up until the mid 1960s, there was really no effective medical treatment for opiate use disorder. Doctors Vincent Dole and Maria Nicewander. Dr. Dole was a, a physician and scientist, and Maria Nicewander, a psychiatrist, um, who actually really pioneered methadone treatment. And it came out of their work of really studying uh, uh, heroin addicted patients in the community over a 15, 14 year span who were in and out of hospitals and in and out of prison because of their opiate use disorder. And what they determined um, with their research is that methadone is real or methadone and heroin addiction is really a treatable disorder. And that methadone really is used to normalize the metabolism and thus the behavior associated with uh, heroin addicted individuals. So when methadone is used and what their research discovered is that it did relieve narcotic craving or hunger, 
It was medically safe. It helped patients function more normally without the anxiety associated with drug craving and constantly seeking um, uh, the medication or their drugs. Methadone itself created sort of a blockade. So patients, when they were on methadone, did not experience the euphoria or the tranquilizing or analgesic effects of short-acting opioids like heroin and other medications like Oxycontin and um, fentanyl that's out on the street today, which is what we see mostly for our patients who come into treatment. And what they also learned in their research is that the, a patient could be on the same dose and be on that dose for a long period of time and may not need any changes to their dose unless they became pregnant or on other medications that interfered with their, their dose itself. The goals of methadone treatment um, are not dissimilar from goals of buprenorphine treatment, and that is to prevent or reduce drug craving, to prevent or eliminate the withdrawal symptoms associated with continuous opiate use to prevent relapse to the use of their addicted drug and to restore normalcy to someone's life so that um, it would allow them to actually function um, normally without experiencing the high of the use of their opiates or the withdrawal from the lack of access to their opiates. So why methadone treatment? I mean, methadone maintenance as a medication um, really has the same goals of other addiction treatments. So our goal is to rehabilitate a patient or to habilitate a patient who already you know, had stability in their lives. And our goal is also for abstinence, but it's abstinence with the use of medication as opposed to abstinence with, which is typically thought of without medication. It lasts for 24 to 36 hours um, by taking the medication once a day and in an adequate dose it uh, creates what we call a cross tolerance or a blockade to opiates. It is, uh, replaces short acting, illegal, poor quality, expensive, injunct injectable drugs with a long acting oral legal medication that is quality controlled. And the best results for methadone treatment is also psychosocial treatment. So that counseling is a critical component along with the medication to help someone achieve abstinence and stability in their life. The, some of the research that's been done over the 80s, 90s, and actually continues to be replicated is what the impact of methadone maintenance has done. And what we have learned is that it reduced death rates associated with opioid use. It reduces IV drug use. It reduces crime days. There's a reduction in the rate of HIV seroconversion and infection, a reduction in relapse to IV drug use, and it improves uh, health and social functioning, functioning and the ability for patients to uh, maintain and um, enjoy employment. And so these are really very important outcomes. And it also re increases the retention and treatment um, as compared to some of the medication-free alternatives that had been used in terms of retaining someone in treatment over the long term. So they're ableized to stable those receptors uh, that Claudia talked about and actually allow someone to engage in treatment and deal with the issues that are going on in their lives. Who's eligible for methadone treatment? Well, you have to be currently addicted to an opioid medication. You have to have become addicted for at least a 12 month period prior to admission. Um, for those for a lesser period of time, you might enter a 180 day detox program, or you may try another kind of uh, treatment like uh, buprenorphine treatment. There are exceptions to these rules. Now these rules are guided by federal regulation. And 
So exceptions might be if you've been in a correctional institution and have left within a six month period, if you are pregnant, or you've been treated um, up to two years after being discharged from a treatment program. So these are elements that could are exceptions to the rule. Method of treatment can be also used for patients that are under 18 years old. Uh, and for those patients, you must have parental, parental consent. And you also have to have documentation that you have been unsuccessful in other kinds of short-term detox or other medication tr free treatment within a 12 month period. Methadone treatment programs in Massachusetts do not admit patients for, who are under 18 years old, uh, partly because the environment and the structure of methadone programs are more geared towards adult patients. So for patients who come to us who are under 18, we often refer them to buprenorphine treatment that may be more appropriate for them at that period of time. So let's look at how methadone works compared to um, heroin, or I would say fentanyl, or other kinds of um, opiates that a patient may be addicted to. So when someone uses heroin, um, it acts very quickly, and their first reaction is to get very high. And then their um, symptoms start to increase over time. So once they go from that high state, they are a period of time where they are in this what we call this comfort zone, where they're not in uh, intoxicated, or they're not in what we consider sick or withdrawal. And that can be anywhere from three to five hours after their last dose of a short acting opioid. What patients tend to present with initially are what we call subjective withdrawal symptoms. So these are symptoms that you cannot uh, see, but that a patient reports. So the achiness, um, nausea, uh, and things that a patient would report are examples of uh, subjective withdrawal, anxiety, and so forth. Then they begin to have objective symptoms. So things that you can see, dilated pupils, um, uh, sweating, and other kinds of increase in pulse and other kinds of measurable withdrawal symptoms. When we administer methadone, it keeps the patient within that comfort zone. So they're not getting too much medication to create a high state, and they're getting enough to prevent uh, withdrawal of becoming sick. So it keeps them stable and allows them to engage in the important psychosocial treatments. So what does treatment look like? Well, methadone treatment programs provide comprehensive uh, services. So they get a psychosocial assessment. They get an initial physical exam and blood work and a pregnancy test if you're a woman. And uh, they get annual physical exams and blood work as well. They get medication daily until they're stabilized and then they're eligible for take-home medication. They get routine um, and regular urine or saliva testing for drugs that they may be using um, uh, illicitly. They, we check the prescription monitoring program, which is really very important on admission annually, and if we have any concern about that. So any kind of medications they may be prescribing that we may not know about that could interfere with their opioid treatment. We do tests to determine whether the medication is metabolizing if we see some symptoms that seem unusual to what we would expect. And they're required to be in counseling services. So individual group and family counseling that uh, with treatment plans that are individualized for that patient. In addition, we're constantly doing assessments and co-managing other kinds of disorders. So 
if somebody has a psychiatric disorder, like Dr. Weiss talked about, we might be identifying these disorders and making sure that they're also getting treatment for them. There's a tremendous amount of case management and coordination of care. So for their medical care, uh, for chronic pain, if they're pregnant for their OB care, um, and psychiatric symptoms, as I've, uh, I've mentioned. And we do a lot of education around uh, cessation of tobacco use, education about HIV and hepatitis C and other kinds of risk factors, you know, um, associated with needle use or opiate use. So it's comprehensive care. I want to talk a little bit about stigma and I like the statement because I think it really addresses you know, what we need. Addiction is a condition or disease that you have. It is not who you are. And I think that's really important. I say this to patients over and over again when they use pejorative language to describe their disorder or describe themselves. So who are our patients? I mean, who are the patients that come to methadone treatment? Well, they might have sub multiple substance use disorders. So patients who um, may look intoxicated um, and people attribute that to that medication, it may be that they're using other drugs that are causing symptoms of intoxication, not the methadone per se. Um, they've been patients who've used prescription opioids initially and then progressed to heroin. So they may have been prescribed medications for pain and now are seeking illicit um, medications. They may never have used intravenous drug use, but only use uh, intravenous drugs, but may have um, only used prescription and oral medications. I mentioned psychiatric disorders and the patients we see are often those who are suffering from anxiety and depression and trauma. They may have a, a range of serious medical disabilities. They may be patients who did not do well in buprenorphine treatment for a number of different reasons. They may be younger patients now that are entering treatment. They may be the white suburban young adults, returning veterans, people who are coping with serious uh, injuries as a result of accidents, disabled chronic pain patients, and older um, patients living you know, with chronic disease. But they are also, our patients are also um, functioning and active members to our society. So they are drug and alcohol free and on take home medications. They may be working in supermarkets. They may be working professionals, caring for their children. And um, some of them are working in addiction treatment programs. So we need to have a full scope of people with addictive disorders Addiction is a people problem. They it scopes a full range. But unfortunately, stigma still holds for many of our patients. And it's really um, talked about in terms of the disease itself and stigma to the people who have it. So that, why is that the case? Well, methadone treatment, because of the laws in its etiology and how it's evolved, has really been isolated from mainstream uh, medicine. Programs are often located in poor neighborhoods. Medical professionals and the general public have had a lack of knowledge about methadone treatment and how it worked best. So there's always, or they're often encouraging people to taper off medication as opposed to um, staying it over the long term. We would never say to somebody with diabetes, okay, you've had your um, insulin for a long enough period of time, it's now time to taper off. It is a chronic disease that needs management over the period of time. So some people who say we're just substituting one drug for another. Methadone is a medication that you take for a disease that you have. It is not um, uh, a, a drug that is like the drugs on the street. So I make the distinction between drugs that you take on your own and medications that are prescribed for you. Patients are stereotyped and misunderstood. Many of them, their medical, medical complaints are not taken seriously because they get seen as being drug seeking. They are often isolated for self-help groups that don't understand methadone treatment and don't consider them in recovery because they're on a medication. 
Um, they lose jobs. They've had their licenses restricted because they're on this medication. But I, and they're also, the person itself and their treatment are referred to with pejorative language, like many of my colleagues have talked about earlier today. They're considered clean or dirty, depending on whether they continue to use or relapse. They're talked about as addicts, as opposed to an illness that they have. You've heard other pejorative statements that if they're on methadone treatment, they're on liquid handcuffs. And probably the most offensive that I've heard more recently is referring to the people and the treatment and the location as methadone mile. So I think that um, it's really important for us to address the stigma so that we're not stigmatizing the patients who have it or the programs that offer this treatment and understand that we're all in this together. So thank you very much for an opportunity to present to you. Um, and I hope this information has been helpful. Great, definitely. Thank you so much, Dr. Kaufman. Uh, wonderful information. The next speaker I have the honor of introducing is, is Mr. Eddie Casado. Uh, Eddie is doing what, in my opinion, is probably the most important role uh, for anybody treating substance use disorder. Um, Eddie is a recovery coach, and there are other names for this, like a peer coach, for example, or an advocate, but it's someone that has lived experience, and they've decided to turn that around in their recovery and help other people that are, are struggling with the disease. Um, Eddie is a recovery coach for Mass General Brigham and Population Health, and we're delighted he's joining us today to talk about the role of a recovery coach. Turn it over to you, Eddie. Well, th well, thank you so much for, for having me here. For me, it's a, it's a privilege and an honor. Um, and I'm here, I think it was meant to be, because I, I, I say that because I was not officially the one to be speaking. I'm standing in for uh, Wendia Rodriguez, which is the lead coach for, for the team. And nonetheless, it's an honor. So I think I share that. Um, um, like you said, uh, my name is Eddie Casado. I'm a person in long-term recovery, and basically what that means to me is that in the past six-plus years, I've been able to live life on life's terms. I've been able to, to remarry. I've been able to uh, um, obtain a job, and this, me being here today, is part of my recovery capital. Um, without recovery, this would have never happened. Um, so this is to me, in my language, is a blessing. Um, so anyway, I want to share a little bit of what a recovery coach is, um, a little bit of what I do, and a brief, um, short about story of my my testimony or my story. Um, basically, as a recovery coach, I carry the message of hope of recovery, that, that recovery is possible. Um, just to be a role model, to be uh, uh, plant the seed of a possibility. Because usually when we are active in our addiction, um, especially if you started um, early on in life, like I did, um, seeing yourself um, drug free seemed like an impossible task. And there was a term I always use, I said, I hate those normal people. I used to say that a lot, you know? And I used to say, I hate those normal people, but basically I just wanted to be one of them, you know? And I come what here I am today, um, um, one of them. So um, I also want to talk about that recovery coach, um, we share our story so, uh, our lived experience to illustrate, like I said, the possibility to, to encourage those who don't see themselves or not even considering, or those who are in recovery themselves as well and want maintenance. Um, so that story that we use is to set the, the, the possibility. And there's a story about this um, runner, his name was Roger Bannister, um, prior to Roger Bannister, um, prior to 1954, um, 
um, we as humans were not able to run a mile under four, four minutes. You know, that was, it could have never been done. But when Ryan Bannister in 1954 broke that record and he ran a mile under four minutes, everybody said it's possible. You know, and today people do it all the time, high school kids do it. Um, so it's not a big deal. You know, so I'm hoping and my dreams and my goal is to um, be that person with the collective of other recovery coach and the support of the clinicians um, that we advocate that so much that it's like running a mile under four minutes, you know, because it's turning that that switch in one's mind of possibility, you know. So basically a recovery coach, that's what I do. Um, we promote multiple pathways to recovery. Um, so I engage individuals um, where I work. I work for Penteco Medical. Uh, I've served that population, I should say, and work in the Haverhill, um, Lawrence, Andover, and Newburyport. And I work with a team, um, community care team, and that entitles social workers and um, behavioral health specialists, community resources, and the PCPs. So my position, I, I, I think I got the best job. You know, I, I love my job. I wake up, you know, wet, go, ready to go to work. Um, it's not, I, I love it. It's, it's been my life. Recovery has been my life. So now being, having a platform or having the opportunity to share with others and resonate with them, that knowing that when they're relapsed or trying to um, get out of a, a detox and relapsing again and, and how you feel inwardly. And it's really, um, sometimes the stigma comes from within, from our own selves, um, based of past experience. And not all the time I believe that um, people who feel stigma are being stigmatized. Yes, we, we get stigmatized, but it's that inward stigma that I, I had to deal with myself first, you know, to then um, fight the language that was shared, you know, clean, dirty, you know, uh, um, substance use disorder versus addict, alcoholic, you know. So we, I promote multiple pathway. And the, fo and the focus of the a recovery coach is on the potential not the pathology, you know, so, so the potential of them recovering, um, that's the focus, not why am I, you know, in, um, using or why I have this problem. It's more um, strength based, based, you know, having the strength, you know, focus on strength um, and giving, meeting them where they're at, you know, and just resonating, creating a, what I call, I call, I call them holy moments, because every time I'm in front of a participant, um, as a non-clinical, as a non-clinical person, I don't use the term "I'm patient." You know, I'm I'm, I'm not a doctor, um, so I use participant. Other recovery coaches use recovery, um, but I I prefer participant because we're participating in this recovery and this person's journey, you know, um, and they're willing to participate with someone who's already done it or, and still working at it. This is a work in progress. This is not something that you did it and, and you're done. No, this is, a, it takes a lot of work. So that's um, some of the ish, um, topics I want to talk about, but there's four goals that I focus on, the most recovery coach do focus is on promote recovery, carry the torch of recovery as possible, remove barriers, you know, by providing resources, um, um, connecting them to communities, um, talking about their health, connecting them back to the PCPs, to um, dietitians, and so forth. 
and connecting people, like I said, to um, services, you know. So I've become very familiar with a lot of the resources in the community, and I have the privilege that I work in a clinic, clinical setting that I don't have to be um, all things to everybody because I work with an awesome team that um, I utilize their skills, the social workers, the uh, resource specialists, you know, so it's collaborative um, work um, in my position in the clinical setting. Um, and there are recovery coaches that are working community, uh, like um, um, recovery centers, you know, and courts, the recovery coach that worked in the hospitals, the emergency room, you know, and the goal is to encourage hope, optimism, optimism and healthy living. You know, so that's basically in a nutshell um, what I do. Um, and then what helps me to set the platform is that I share my story. I'm a person, in, like I said, in long-term recovery, um, a person, as the doctor, I think Weiser was mentioning, um, as he was sharing his um, presentation, I saw myself in most of what he said. You know, a person who had multiple ODs, multiple visits to the um, emergency room, given that resource list <laughs> many um, few times, um, and to 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 also pro not promote, but to I'm here today because so um, um, buprenorphine helped me stabilize my life. You know, I, I, I had two years of, of treatment, which stabilized myself. I didn't have to deal with the, the craving, that cycle that um, it was mentioned. Um, and then after two years, I was able to wing myself off of that um, because I, I felt so stable. And like I said, I wanted to be one of those normal people that I hated, you know. <laughs> So, so boxing was the way, that was my pathway. Um, that's what um, gave me the opportunity to now have this job, to, to remarry, to be a father, to, to be present in life, live life on life's term. You know, so um, I promote, um, well, I guide, um, um, medical assisted treatment to people. I, I, I share the, the, that pathway with other ones. Um, but I, also, I strongly believe that um, medical assisted treatment in combination with, you know, counseling is what helped me, you know, because I had to deal with the physical aspect of my addiction, and then I had to deal with the psychological part, um, lots of counseling um, groups. And also today I run two groups um, as a matter of fact, um, today I run one at 12, and uh, Thursday I run another one at 2 o'clock. So I try to engage um, participants into those groups and promote also for them to seek um, groups within their community. Right now, everything's being done virtually. Um, so that's what I've been doing for the past couple of, well, since March. But in a nutshell, that's what a recovery coach does. Um, maybe next time I'll have a, a slide. I, I really like the slideshow, the presentation. With that said, I'll, I'll keep my, my time short. I don't know if I passed my minutes or not, but that's about it. Thank you so much. You're perfect. Thank you so much for sharing your story and your work. It's so important. Greatly appreciate it. Um, so now we get to, uh, we're going to move on to Dr. Natigna Desai. Um, I'm delighted to introduce her as well. Um, this is actually the first time we've met, so it's nice to meet you. Um, but we, we really wanted to, to at least include something about our veterans. Uh, very important population um, that has a lot of struggles with opioid use disorder and other substance use disorders. So Dr. Desai is going to talk about that. Um, she is the director of uh, psychiatry, or the chief of psychiatry, and the chief of the substance abuse service line at the Bedford VA, and also um, an assistant professor of psychiatry at BU and UMass. Uh, welcome, Dr. Desai. Thank you so much, Dr. Weiner and Dr. Jacobs, for taking this very important initiative 
putting together such an esteemed panel of um, speakers who has done so much in this field with their expertise and also the passion that you just saw today. Um, I am personally very honored to have um, been invited and also representing the VA and uh, VHA. With that, um, let me just quickly run through the slides. Um, as um, I also want to thank the audience for staying on. Uh, I know we are running on an overtime and I will try my best to get my side of the story uh, run quickly. Um, so I wanted to give a quick overview of an opioid epidemic. You have heard a lot about why it's important to um, pay attention to this, what has it done to the society, particularly to the veterans' health, um, what are the VA resources and what is the VA doing about it, what are the resources for the family and caregivers, and particularly what each one of us can do for this. So as you see the data, the substance abuse is not a new thing. It's been around and it has done its impact on the society on and off in various forms. Most recently, we are all focused on the opioids and it's not just the United States, the world, as you can see, between 1990 and 2017, the opioids have taken on a lot of toll, um, particularly in the United States. As you can see, any opioid, the death per 100,000 population has rise um, over the time and it's exponential. The data is a little bit behind, but if we take a look at last few years, we, and I think majority of us who is here today does know, they do know the impact. Let me focus particularly on the opioid use, use disorder. Okay, so as you can see from this slide, um, we have lost a lot more veterans to the opioid overdose compared to the Vietnam. Uh, almost four times, and this data, as I said, is, is somewhat behind. So I think if we look at the most recent data, it might even be um, um, more significant. Um, in general, what we know is the veterans are 5.4 times more likely to be using heroin compared to the one who have not used any opioids. Um, also, uh, since 2001, the proportion of VHA user in mental health condition or substance use disorder has increased from approximately 27% in 2001 to 40% in 2014. Another important fact is that suicide rates amongst those with mental health condition or substance use disorder decreased from 77.6 7 to 57.0 per 100,000 between 2001 and 2014. But the rates of suicide were elevated amongst the VHA patients diagnosed with an opioid use disorder and also have increased since 2001. So there are some data indicating that one in every third overdose death is a veteran. Um, poison is the second most common mean of suicide for female veterans. So 32% of female veterans who die by suicide have used poison. A poison in majority of the cases is opioid. Um, this data also emphasizes, and I think we heard a lot from a various panel of speakers um, that um, why do we need to pay attention to this opioid epidemic? What is the biology of addiction? We also heard about the relationship between trauma and, and substance use disorder. We also heard from Dr. Weiss about the importance of co-occurring disorders and substance use as well as the opioid use disorder. Particularly what was striking is that he showed his slide where veterans with opioid use disorder were six times higher at a higher risk of dying from suicide. 
So here, what I'm showing is the prevalence of PTSD and substance abuse disorder. So these are the various substance of abuse with veterans who have PTSD as a diagnosis. And as you can see, opioid is number one. In this slide, I'm also showing the trends in the rates of past year substance use diagnosis by drug among veterans with PTSD and SUD. So as we heard that the relationship between trauma and substance use disorder is well established. Relationship between trauma and opioid use disorder is significant and it has impacted the veterans healthcare significantly. Here you can see the opioid risk overdose versus suicide and as Dr. Weiss showed that it is often very difficult to differentiate between an accidental overdose and, and a suicide but many of them may have had a suicide, um, suicidal ideations and how that increases the risk. Here, what you can she, uh, see is that each one of the medical and psychiatric comorbidity increases the risk of overdose or suicide, but how the opioid use disorder actually, and particularly opioid use disorder, along with the sedative hypno hypnotic use may contribute to the risk of the overdose and suicide significantly. Um, here you can see that um, the US population in general, and again, the data is a little bit behind, 13.3 per 100,000 dies from opioid related death. Um, the US veteran population is actually very significantly affected, about 19.5. But here, what I'm showing is that the one that are being treated at the VA are even more complex and at a higher risk. So. Uh, unfortunately, not all the veterans are getting the attention and not being they are not being treated at the VA, but the ones that are being treated at the VA are extremely complex and at a slightly higher risk compared to the veterans who are not at the VA and also the general population. So having said that, VA has responded very well to this opioid epidemic by putting together a number of initiatives. Um, as you heard about the medications for opioid use disorder, VA has been at the forefront of offering these medications. And I'm very proud to say in the New England, which is known as the Vision One within the VA, was one of the first one amongst the nation and Bedford was actually uh, uh, at a leading forefront of offering the MOUDs and bringing the Suboxone in treatment. Um, of course, VA has also put together number of evidence-based clinical practice guidelines. Um, the STORM, which is very unique, and I'm sure other systems have done that, but the VA has done it very well. It's a um, stratification tool for opioid risk mitigation. So with the click of a button for each one of the veteran, we can actually see who is at a higher risk and provide proactive interventions. Uh, VA has also put together the opioid overdose education and naloxone distribution and it is actually done very well. Um, majority of the VA are providing uh, the naloxone to more than 50% of the veterans with opioid use disorder diagnosis. Most recently, VA has also launched a program called Stepped Care for Opioid Use Train the Trainer program. What we have recognized is that the MOUD is being prescribed by the psychiatrist, there was a slow start. There were a number of ex wayward physicians, but not all of them were comfortable prescribing. We have overcome that hurdle. Now the second focus is on the non-psychiatry physicians. And with this program, we are hoping that we can actually have more 
primary care and family medicine prescribers providing the medications for opioid use disorders as well. Veterans um, system also has the best veterans justice outreach. And as you saw in some of the other presentations that uh, there is some racial discrimination. Unfortunately, there is also uh, some disparity between uh, the the legal system and, and who gets uh, punished. And this VJO actually helps veterans with substance use disorder stay out of the jail system. Uh, we also have drug courts, which again supports the veterans with um, non-criminal substances disorders and engages them into treatment. We has also put in lots of em emphasis on research along with the opioid use disorder, the medications for opioid use disorder, the dual diagnosis, uh, co-occurring illnesses, the demographic differences, and most recently, the COVID impact and COVID related or the uh, racial differences and how that may have impact um, on this um, intervention. What has Bedford VA done? So, uh, of course, Bed Bedford VA has a number of initiatives, the Opioid Safety Initiative, the Education for Prescribers and Responders, the Campus Safety, uh, which actually um, comprises of a representation from every single uh, discipline, including the police and the housekeeping. Uh, the work on minimizing the co-prescribing, the monitoring of pharmacy and pain committee, which actually um, monitors the trending of prescribing and provide the education so that we can prevent some overdose risk. Um, alternatives to pain management, the substance abuse disorder treatment, the MOUD, Bridge Clinic, and peer services, which is the VS counterpart of the recovery coach. Um, this is what we Bedford VA offers. They offer detox, the intensive outpatient program, the recovery maintenance support, traditional outpatient aftercare, motivational counseling, suboxone, sublocate, and vivitrol clinics, as well as COVID modifications were implemented, providing virtual group and virtual intensive outpatient day program. So we are trying to stay ahead. Uh, of course, we have the longer term program and the resources like the domiciliary, the transitional housing, the compensated work therapy, and also some emergency beds for patients who may need additional support. And these are the resources for the family and the caregivers. Um, um, Again, the coffee social is one of our very new initiative where some of our peers are going out in the, pro, in the community and meeting the veterans at a um, cafe or Starbucks or um, conducting coffee social. And that, that is how they are trying to engage more veterans into obtaining care at the VA. So in conclusion, Opioid addiction and opioid overdose epidemic is a national crisis. Federal, state, and state government, as well as the VA, has, um, they have increased education resources and interventions. Each and every member of the society is valuable. We all have an important role. Uh, treatment resources are out there and available. We have the responsibility to be educating and utilizing the resources and each one of us can save a life. So with that, thank you again. Thank you, Dr. Desai. And uh, I have uh, two, two tasks for us. I wanna do some concluding remarks and then focus on how uh, people can take a screening. First, I wanna thank uh, Representative Santiago and Senator Sear, and particularly uh, Mayor Walsh for their uh, thoughtful uh, comments and uh, commitment to this uh, critical area that uh, uh, we're all trying to to address uh, and as well as to Dr. Roseman for the uh, involvement of the Mass Medical Society and uh, all of the physicians in Massachusetts who are committed to take care of uh, uh, patients suffering from opioid disorder. Uh, I want to thank uh, Dr. Weiner. It's been a pleasure to put this uh, excellent program together. And as I think we've heard uh, th throughout the day, uh, experts talk about uh, how treatment works, 
and that it's effective. And then particularly to have uh, people with lived experience share their stories, the struggles, uh, how they got there and how uh, uh, they, they're working to uh, both recover and the uh, awareness that recovery is, is a lifelong process. And that really leads me to uh, one of the key themes of uh, the day, and that's that uh, opioid disorder is an illness, not a weakness, uh, and that there's an ongoing crisis. But so if we acknowledge that it's an illness, what we all want to uh, be aware of is that there is evidence-based treatments that work. And we've heard uh, both the use of uh, suboxone and uh, methadone and the role of psychosocial treatment, the role of uh, recovery, uh, the need to be uh, attentive to uh, the disparities in treatment that uh, exist not only with opioid uh, disorder, but with all types of uh, uh, healthcare. Uh, the other point of what uh, we've put together is to provide people, uh, individuals and loved ones with the opportunity to take an anonymous interactive uh, screening. And uh, I, I will talk uh, uh, in, in a few moments about what that consists of. And that people who score positive uh, will, have, will be directed to uh, resources that are available through the uh, list of hospitals and clinics that are uh, host sites as well as the 800 line that, that has been mentioned. So uh, just to reiterate, in Massachusetts, we believe that there's uh, over 275,000 persons who suffer, who struggle with opioid disorder. And as uh, 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 one of our speakers have mentioned, only 10% of individuals, whether it's nationwide, but in Massachusetts are in treatment. And so one of the purposes of the day is to bring awareness to the prevalence, but also uh, how do we get uh, people, our loved ones into treatment? Uh, unfortunately, uh, about five people a day are dying of opioid overdose, and that is in, that it has uh, increased uh, during the, uh, the epidemic. So the screening tool that's provided for you is, pro is uh, developed from the uh, World Health Organization. It's called the ASSIST, the Alcohol, Smoking, and Substance Involvement Screening Test. Uh, I have adapted it for specifically for opioid use disorder, and it can be accessed 24 hours a day, seven days a week, every day. Uh, so uh, I would encourage uh, the people who have questions about whether or not they have opioid disorder in themselves, or whether or not a loved one has it to take the screening, and just to emphasize that it is anonymous. Um, so what, what are the questions consist of? And there's only eight questions. It takes a few minutes to take. Uh, it has to do with the, uh, uh, whether or not one has ever used op opioids, um, has anyone addressed concern about your use? Have you tried, and this is an important issue, have you tried and failed to control, cut down, or stop using opioids? And I think we heard from Mike, uh, efforts people make to do that. And to, to be aware, the important point is that is what uh, medication uh, assisted treatment does. Uh, have you ever uh, injected opioids? Uh, and then we talk about the frequency, uh, the urges, which, which again, we hear from uh, both uh, uh, Mike and Eddie, um, and how it's impacted your life. And I think this is, uh, again, such an important point that, uh, you know, uh, Mike gave this interesting analogy between uh, uh, the, the uh, low lobster and high lobster, um, that unfortunately, as with other illnesses, illnesses impact our life, and that's why we need to encourage treatment. 
because treatment works and it not only helps with the specific disease, but helps with other aspects of our life. And then uh, the last question has to do with whether or not one has failed to do what's normally expected. Um, so people who score positive or remain concerned will be referred to specific resources in Massachusetts. And uh, if you have your smartphone, you can scan this code and a list of uh, facilities will come up. Um, there's the helpline, which is 1-800-327-5050, as, as well as the helpline ma.org. Um, as Dr. Desai mentioned, there's a, a excuse me, a veterans crisis line, 1-800-273-8255. And then there's the list of uh, hospitals and community mental health centers uh, that you can access on our website, or as I said, uh, uh, scan this code. So um, uh, I wanna thank you all for, for listening and, and hope that uh, you've heard today that uh, treatment does work, that we need to acknowledge that uh, opioid use disorder is an illness, not a weakness, uh, we need to take any value judgment out of uh, uh, someone who suffers from opioid disorder and to truly understand that it's not just a matter of uh, willpower. It, as with any other disease, it's acknowledging that we have a disease and what do we need to, what do we need to do to help ourselves and what, what we need to do is to reach out and get the treatment that's available and that's evidence-based. And with that, I wanna to conclude today and wish you all well.